Yes, I know. How dare we make math into pain? I don't know who's who. Who could we blame for that? Certainly not me. I love math. And where is my apologies for the dead air there? You never like to have dead air on professional radio, and you certainly uh, you certainly don't like to have it here either. Hi, YouTube. Welcome. We're about to work on uh, Lena Lilaf again. Uh, what we're going to do is we're going to basically make Lena Lilaf into a language that has all sorts of different um, registers and uh, historical phases. And what we're going to do at the same time is clear up some of the things that have been kind of bothering me about the uh, the vibe of Lena Lilaf and in the process make it into the perfect cellar door aesthetic language. So let's go. Let's do it. Okay, so let's define some terms, shall we? Let's, what is this? What is going on here? Okay, so this we don't need. Um, so we have old lenothylif. We can have middle lenothylif. And we can have at the same time, something like, we're going to have better names for this eventually, but like high middle linothylif, which could be our Eustamia influenced version. And then we have, I'm just going to steal the terms from the history of English because it makes me laugh. Early modern linothylif. I don't know. How do I get this all working? And then on on the side of this, so this is going to be more, so this is going to be less prestige, and this is going to be more prestige here. Old Lenothylif, relatively um, undifferentiated in terms of, of the high and low prestige varieties. Middle Lenothylif has this Eustamia influenced version, which is more prestigious. And then colloquial Middle Lenothylif is the thing that's rounding out the rest of the uh, of the continuum. Early modern Lenothylif, actually, we have Kranz Lor spoken in the, uh, put this like this, we have Kranz Lor spoken as the high status language, and we have the Creole spoken as the low status language, and then we have presumably Something like this is what I'm thinking. So, ah, maybe maybe this is better. So Eustamia is the high prestige language here. High middle and the is the sort of middle prestige language. And then we could call this low middle and the I don't know, just a, just a name. We'll come with uh, better names for this. So in the old period, we have everything you know, not a huge amount of um, diglossia to get the uh, the term out there. Yeah, whereas in in this middle period, we have Eustamia being spoken as the literary language, or being, well, being used as a literary language. We have um, the Eustamia-influenced version of Lenothylif being used in these sort of less formal contexts, but but still maybe, I don't know, um, so you know, not not everyday speech between friends, uh, which would which would be the province of low middle the Lenothylif. Then in the early modern period, the Lenothylif Kranzlor Creole gets spoken as uh, as the sort of colloquial vernacular. Um, early modern Lenothylif is kind of in the middle, and Kranzlor is spoken as the high prestige language, or is used, um, and then. This is then Kranzlor stops being used in the modern in the late modern period, um, but otherwise the situation is rema remains unchanged. So that's the uh, that's the gist. So so what's going on here? This is diglossia, or in some cases triglossia, where we have different languages or varieties of the language used by the same people in different social circumstances. So. Over here on the more side, we might have um, formal writing, government documents, etc. 
maybe informal writing, public speech, and casual speech. Something like this could be the way that we slice the pie. Of course, you know, maybe in each period it's slightly different what falls into what bucket, but this is the situation that we're looking at. So if this is the case, then let's, you know, we already have our little timeline here. Why don't we, um, why don't we make use of it? So let's push this over. So maybe we can push protocol three a little bit back, maybe like this, so that we can have some time, a little time for old, old Linodilef. And then we have middle Linodilef like this. And then we have early modern Lenadilith and Kranzlor for about 200 years. And then Lenadilith, modern Lenadilith here and the Creole. So the Creole is actually going to be spoken here too. There we go. So that's roughly the situation. I think we might need a little bit more time for early modern Lenadilith. Hmm. Well, we have 400 years of middle, 300 of old, 200 of early modern. It's a very rapidly changing period, so that's fine. Um, and then 300 of of modern land of Ilef. Yeah, well, you know, I'm satisfied with that. That makes sense. Old land of Ilef might might need a few more hundred years. And so what we've been, what we've been describing is, of course, there's a there are some sort of mystery years in here, why don't we say, where all sorts of stuff has been happening. I think we need to, so these are the transitional forms between protocol and protocol three and Lenadilef. And then by the time we get old Lenadilef written in around 1100 before the present, then it looks like this. It looks like what we've been working on. So month, 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 month et cetera, et cetera. Okay, middle and the is going to be, so let's start placing our, our changes. So we have old and which is basically as described, as originally described in this spreadsheet. Then we have low, middle, and high, middle, and influenced by Ustamia um, SOV tendencies, Iya genitive, widespread borrowing from Ustamia. Question from Echoed Words. Yeah, Lena Dilev is a, is a, a call language. Um, it descends from protocol, just like Ustamia does. It's from this branch three that we haven't named yet. So there's a, a sister language which we call branch uh, th uh, 3a, which we don't know very much about yet. Um, we'll have to come back to it. <laughs> There's an in-universe call. <laughs> it's, you know, hey everyone, would you like to learn the the beautiful and mysterious language of old Lena Dilef? Well, I have just the course for you. Yep, I can see it. All right. Low middle Lena Dilef. So... What is what is going on here? We have realization um, of of nouns and verbs begins. So this is also going to be the case in high middle and the left as well. And then we have early modern I left and modern and the left, which we don't know very much about yet because we have to work on the context stuff. Um, what else? Oh yeah, so we we are going to have some sound changes as well. Let's just say extensive regularization of nouns and verbs. Sound changes, so we're going to be removing, well, we're going to be playing at least with ch, um, front rounded vowels. What else did we say? Where's the, the pet peeves? Yeah, th that's all. Okay. Uh, uh, Echoed Words asks, are there going to be any languages branching off from Lena Dilef, um as they evolve? That's entirely possible. I haven't thought about that yet, but basically the way we're doing it in Lexergy, we can essentially just 
say stop at any point and use that as the, uh, the basis for another language. So as we do more of the world building, I think we'll, we'll be able to answer or we'll be able to create these languages as we need. Yeah, so that's gonna be an interesting and very long project. But that's what we're here for, right? Okay, so then what are our what are our changes going to be? So I'm gonna scroll up in the chat because I saw some great suggestions about what happens to ch. So yeah, maybe so here's some possibilities. What's gonna happen to to ch, which is voiced and it's voiced allophone? Maybe we get ch going to h, huh, a familiar sound change. Um, we could also get, we could also get r just dropping out. Uh, I don't know how my fancy, z let's just say zero. We could have some compensatory lengthening happening. So credit where credit is due, echoed words saying the velar fricatives could become h. Moon Truth is saying that uh, the voiced one could be easy to lose. And Galactic Sand is suggesting that maybe we could do a Mongolian and uh, have them lengthen vowels. I like that idea. With compensatory lengthening. Another thing that occurred to me is we could have the sort of German situation happen where H becomes palatal uh, after a front vowel, which it does in all of the accusative cases. Uh, so, where, oh, where's my little, now where, where on earth is it? Got to get to my IPA keyboard here, and we have got to take the voiceless palatal fricative out. So, H to H, after front vowels, something like this. Now I've lost my view of you. There we are. And so we could have, what, where was an example? So, susukeich. So this, so susukeich, we'll go to susukeich, which I think I've been doing already. Um, and then what we could do is have this h become a ya. And I'm thinking of something that happened in um, some varieties of Irish. So you have, you have, these, um, well, something like that anyway. You have nouns that end in ach that when they, uh, in, in certain forms in Irish, uh, that final sound becomes palatalized. And instead of becoming um, uh, eich, it becomes something like e because it's become a y. So the, the y, and I think that there's a bit more to say about that, but Let's be let's be fast and loose here, right? So here to ya, and then we could have something like yeah, something like that. So so susuke would become susuke, and I think this would be relatively friendly to um, this would this would be relatively friendly to what am I thinking? The Kranzlor speakers, which I don't think are going to be too able to pronounce or if we can take a look at their phonology for a second. We have it's this this uh, column here. Their language sounds like doskrit, hunzun, liap, liao, plit, siu. So they have they're they're okay with yod, but uh, I don't think they're going to be too a uh, too able to handle hia. And so this could work well, nicely with our, um, our modern stage of the language as well, which is going to be heavily influenced by Kranzlor. Okay, right, so something like this. Um, so then we would get susukei becoming pronounced like susukei, susukei. And that could work, that could work. Okay, so this I kind of like. I think, I think we could do this. So use this deletion of r with compensatory lengthening. 
So what would that look like? So basically, this would be our, this would be our, these would be our sound changes. So let's find a meath anagladas tamanech. So what would this turn into? So meath would be the same. Let me just get all the IPA. Meath anagladas. So this is schwa na. I'll write it out, out all as it is now, and then uh, we will we'll do the change. Sorry, this is just going to take me a second. Okay, something like this. All right, so there we go. So if we do this plan, we would turn into meath analadas tamanei. Meath analadas, analadas tamanei. Yeah? That could work. And what is this cross in Aglavis? So we should also look at ways that we might regularize these these um, nouns and verbs. So meath can stay because that's nominative. Tamanej is this accusative form. Let's go back to our charts. So taimen is river, tamanej is the accusative form. Um, so if we were to make this into a regularized form, it would turn into taimenach. And so let's, let's, let's also change the morphology. So time, uh, oops, 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 oops. Okay, okay. What have I done? How do I get it back? No. Okay. So let's make a version with the change morphology. Time, uh, time and I, time and I. So instead of having this um, this ablauding time and time and I, we have just time and time and I. I is the accusative form, and maybe I simplifies to E, just for cellar door purposes. And if you don't know what I mean when I'm saying cellar door, this is a reference to uh, the fact that Tolkien thought that cellar door was the most beautiful uh, sequence of sounds in the English language. And it's just a pity that it didn't have as beautiful of a meaning. So then, okay, so that would turn into taimani. Meath and aglavis taimani. And if we change our verb to be more regularized, call and figure out where everything is challenge 2022, Impossible difficulty. Um, so, anagladish. What is that verb? Cross. I don't remember. Do we have it in our lexicon? Of course not, because I haven't kept up to date. Okay, so let's go back and we'll find cross. Oh, onaquila. Okay, that's what it is. So, let's find out what the Base form is anoch. Okay, that's good. That's going to give us some some stuff to, to work with. So anoch, and what is it going to what is it going to regularize as? So so what do we have? We haven't filled out all of these incidentally, but but we can at least give a uh, give a start. Okay, anoch. So. We know that these are vowel F, so something like an anorif. Then the same thing here, anorit. And here we have a bit of a difference because the schwa stem has no suffix, but all the others have T, so we can regularize to T. Similarly here, schwa stem has no suffix, but we can regularize to n. Um, here we have aish, aish, ish, ish. So here we can regularize to ish. Here we can regularize, uh, regularize to uk. So essentially we're just having epithetic schwa before the constant that's shared in all of these endings. Um, here we have enorus, enoruk. So substantive and conditional two are merging. 
which already is occurring in some most conjugations. Um, anorevus, anorevul, anorev, something like that. So this would be the regularized form. Let's get that a bit more centralized. So given this, what we have is anaglavish, anaglavus, right? I think that's it. Let's go back. Anaglavus. This is the conditional one of anoch. So back up, conditional one, anogavus. All right. So then back down, sorry. So we have anogavus. And because we have this um, voice feeler fricative, that's going to delete. And I think we can we can actually have a long vowel here, maybe. And know this rather than a know of this. Uh, well, okay, let's 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 not do that yet. That's what I want to do eventually. But instead, we can have just a vowel schwa hiatus. Myth a know of this timony. So this would be my idea for for middle linodilif. So we've had a lot of regularization of nouns and verbs. Uh, we have these sound changes going on. Um, and we would write it. I don't know how we would write it yet. We might write it the same. Or maybe we could, uh, we could, yeah, we'll worry about the romanization later. Let's just write it as if it's, um, as if we're, we're, we've made changes based on the we're not, we don't have a conservative orthography. So, myth and know this time any. Myth and know this time any. Myth and know this time any. Yeah, I dig that. That's kind of cool. All right. All right, I'm proud of this. Why don't we, why don't we play with this a little bit more? Let's finish the poem, um, which will now no longer rhyme. But this is middle and of Okay, I've introduced a temporal paradox because this would only have been borrowed by someone who knew about the Ming people and the Ming language. And if we look at our, so this is written in old Lenavilef and it's a poem translated from Ming, which is much, much later. Okay, so how are we gonna deal with this? Maybe someone has taken that in-universe Cohen Gori's course on old Lenavilef and has translated and has translated a favorite poem from me into um, into into old Lenadilef as a sort of student project. That's how we're going to get out of it. The uh, dental fricatives are not going to last throughout creol uh, creolization. I can I can assure you of that. But for now, they're an essential part of this language. Yeah, that's how they got their college credits exactly. And whatever the in-universe version of the Nobel Prize is, is not far off for that, for that uh, translator. Okay, so let's make the, let's finish off today by making the middle Lenadilef version of this poem. And we won't worry about the meter yet. Let's scoot these over to the right spots. So, myth anoa this timony. And, yeah, myth anoa this timony. Actually, Let's write this, let's write this like so, E-Y, with this slightly older form of the, uh, the reason is that we've been relying on the vowel, um, so if, if there's an E in a, set, in a syllable, that syllable's unstressed, and so if, if we write I, then we don't know where the stress is. So, myth, I know this time any. Um, okay, next sentence. Mi lunukeich kushansuth. So this is going to become. So lunuk, let's say this is another regularized form because it's a loan word, I believe. And we have mi. Uh, here we have a problem for our uh, stress marking rule. Lunuk, two full vowels because it's a loan word. Um, in this case, we will have to. We will have to just mark it explicitly, I think. Let me do that. Mi lunuke kus han suth. 
All right. Fuach, fuach aluth halish. Fuach, fuach. You know, I kind of like, I kind of like chas staying around bef- uh, alongside broad vowels. So fuach aluth halish. And then another line. Susuke nefish sef math. So the question is, does this still rhyme? So meth anoa this time. Taimene. Meth anoethis taimene. Me lunuke. No, it doesn't. Oh, yeah, well, it does. Me lunuke kuschansuth. Fuach aluth halish susuke nefish sefmath. I think we're still fine. I think we're still fine. I think the only problem is that math no longer rhymes with anoeth. But that could be an I rhyme. Oh, wow. Okay, okay, okay. Yes, I know. How dare we make math into pain? I don't know who's who who could we blame for that? Certainly not me. I love math. And I just saw something really cool. Moon Truther suggests this awesome idea, which is that the dental fricatives, because they are so um articulatorily difficult, at least um well we can say they're marked, right? They are not common, they are late to acquire an acquisition, um, they are yeah, well, those two things are probably enough. Um, they are, they may become a marker. If you can do them, it may become a, a marker of um, of some sort of social um, fact. Who knows? Yeah, so then in modern Lanadhyalaf, we might have some words that come from the versions that lost these dental fricatives and some that, that did not. And so things are going to get mis- mixed up. I think we have the opportunity to make something really, 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 really cool and naturalistic with Linda Vyleth. Um But, yeah, in, in universe, Colin Gorey is now canon. He, he lives in the, he lives around, around, I don't know exactly where he lives, but he lives in the present. So he's active year zero before the present. This is the, the realm of, of in universe, Colin Gorey. He loves teaching old Linda Vyleth. This is, you know, how he uh, spends his, his days. And he's a very sought after instructor. And in fact, one of his students is the famous translator of the, uh, the Ming Chicken poem, uh, If You Cross the River. So, you know, quite the career he's had. I will say that. Um, in universe, Colin Gorey does eventually teach poetry, although his technique is more to build you up to it because poetry in, well, in old Lena Vyleth, poetry is very, very tough. You know, that I don't know if, if you know this, but the, uh, the way that you, the, the poetic form works, and this is just a little aside, is that you rhyme the, so each line has three feet, um, which are right headed. So, meath an aglades tamaneich. Me lunu keich kuschan suth, fure chaluth halish, susu keich nefish sef math. Right? So da 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 So it doesn't matter how many unstressed syllables are in between, as long as you have these these stressed syllables on the right of your feet. So that's the first part of the the rule of old Lenadal of poetry. And the second part is you need to rhyme the end of your line with the second foot. In the next line, so meth an aglades tamaneich mi lunu keich kuschan suth furach aluth halish susu keich nefish sef math. And by the way, the last line goes back and rhymes with the second foot of the first line. So math an aglath. So yeah. This is not something that you want to give to someone on day one of an old Linda Vyleth course. Um, but it is kind of cool. And, you know, you can end up doing really cool things with it, uh, especially if you have some great uh, some great source material as the, uh, the chicken poem is. Okay. All right. Well, I think we're about at our, our, our time today. So I'm going to come back here and thank YouTube for joining us. This has been a lot of fun. I think we've we've made a lot of good decisions about 
about Lenathilef, about the relationship between Lenathilef and Yustamia. And I think we're on on the road to making Lenathilef like an extremely naturalistic language with all sorts of intricate historical, I don't know, historical uh, complications and intricacies. And did I say intricate intricacies? I hope not. I probably did. Well, nevertheless, it's the end of the stream, so we can we can get away with that. So YouTube, come back soon and you'll see a lot more of this kind of thing. Um, until then.